morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for braving the cold and joining us here uh, at the U.S. Institute of Peace um, for this discussion on sectarian conflict in Pakistan. Um, my name is Colin Cookman. Uh, I'm a senior program specialist here. Uh, and with me, we have Michael Kalin, Arif Rafiq, Sarhang Hamasid, and Nilafar Siddiqui uh, speaking on these issues, um, primarily focusing on the situation in Pakistan, but also looking to um, draw in some of the regional linkages as well. Um, so uh, just briefly, their bios. Um, Arif, to my right, uh, is an adjunct scholar at the Middle East Institute and president of Vizier Consulting. Um, Michael uh, is a PhD candidate at Yale, uh, previously worked uh, as an advisor to the government of Canada. Um, to my left, Sarhang uh, is a senior program officer here at USIP, uh, uh, working on our Middle East and North Africa programs. Uh, he previously served as uh, Deputy Director General of the Kyrgyzstan Regional Government's Council of Ministers. Uh, and further to my left, uh, Neil Far Siddiqui uh, is as well a PhD candidate at Yale, um, previously working at the International Crisis Group and the International Organization on Migration uh, in Islamabad. So um, just briefly uh, introducing the program today, we'll um, all, uh, well, three of our panelists are uh, recent authors of USIP publications, um, which you can pick up a copy in the back there um, by the door. Um, they're also available on our website, um, focusing on the issue of sectarian conflict uh, in Pakistan. Um, Michael and Nilifer's paper uh, is based on survey work um, done uh, in Punjab and Quetta. Um, and uh, Arif's Peaks uh, is a short summary of a longer forthcoming report um, that will be published by the Middle East Institute um, that sort of takes a, a very detailed uh, historical assessment of the various major points of sec uh, geographical locations of sectarian conflict in Pakistan um, and as well some of the major actors in that. So um, uh, the way we'll try and do this is um, I'll be posing questions to the panelists um, for about the first uh, hour or so, and then we'd like to very much open it up to your questions as well, try and uh, have a conversation uh, about this issue. Um, so with that out of the way, um, I guess we'll start off by um, Michael and Nilifer. Uh, their paper, as I said, is based on sort of uh, opinion survey work conducted uh, in Pakistan. Uh, it's looking specifically at uh, uh, tolerance attitudes. Um, and I was wondering if uh, either of you or both of you could speak a little bit to um, the major findings that came out of that work, summarizing for those who haven't had a chance to read the paper yet, um, and particularly maybe what you found the most significant sources of variation were in terms of sectarian tolerance or intolerance. Thanks, Colin. Uh, I think I'll take a crack first, and then Neela Fur can uh, add her thoughts, too. And let me just begin by um, gratefully acknowledging uh, the financial support of, of USIP, without which uh, the project would never have been possible. So thank you very much for that. Um, <clears throat> I think today I'll be speaking about uh, the survey of about 2,000 Pakistani men that Neela Fur and I conducted uh, across the province of Punjab, as well as the city of Quetta in Balochistan earlier this year. And we had several objectives for this study, and some of which I think will ha help add some uh, local context to this, issue, to this issue, which has much broader national and, and international dimensions. Uh, with regard to the survey, I'm, I'll try to talk about three things. Uh, the first is the people who we surveyed, what we asked them, and thirdly, what they told us. One of our objectives was to be among the first surveys in Pakistan to collect data that would allow a comparison between the views of Pakistani Shias and Pakistani Sunnis. This is actually exceedingly difficult. Uh, although Shias are thought to comprise somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of Pakistan's population, there are no official demographic statistics that are collected by the Pakistani government. So this makes it really very difficult to gain a precise sense of the size and location uh, of each community. It can then be used to sort of sample with conventional techniques and in popular opinion polling. So for this reason, Neela and I developed a strategy in Punjab of sampling around Sunni and Shia houses of worship on the assumption that we were more likely to interview Shias in such vicinities. And then doing this allowed us to paint a representative picture of the population of Shia and Sunni men who live near mosques. Uh, in Balochistan, security concerns really restricted our work to Quetta, 
where we thought it was more appropriate to employ a more straightforward random sample of 800 people just to give a representative picture of the male population of, of Balochistan's largest city. So with those caveats in mind on the kinds of people we're speaking about, uh, let me move on to the actual questions we were interested in. So one of the major objectives we had was to understand sectarian relations and, and predictors of sectarian tolerance along three different dimensions. One was uh, whether respondents, be they Shia or Sunni, would agree with being politically represented by someone across the sectarian divide, so political representation. The second was whether respondents would allow their children to potentially marry someone from the other sect, so social, uh, social tolerance and, distant and closeness. And finally, whether respondents would support the other community if the respondents' own side had initiated some kind of communal violence. So let me then now go to our results and what we found. Uh, I think the, most, the clearest finding from our survey was uh, that Sh Shia respondents consistently tended to agree with each of our statements at higher rates than Sunnis. This difference was statistically and also substantially meaningful. For example, uh, in Punjab, roughly like six in 10 Shia respondents expressed some level of agreement with each of our statements. By contrast, among the Sunnis we, interest, we interviewed in Punjab, like no more than 40% expressed any level of agreement. Uh, Sunni respondents uh, expressed pronounced disagreement, for example, on the question of sectarian intermarriage. Uh, the results for Sunni respondents in Quetta were also quite troubling. Uh, a majority of Sunni respondents expressed disagreement with all of our statements. So even after accounting for a myriad of socioeconomic and, and cultural variables, this issue of uh, being Sunni was one of the strongest and most stable predictors for disagreement with each of our statements. Now, having said that, I'd like to add a, a note of caution in interpreting what these results are, and interpreting them naively, because they show correlations rather than causes. And there are many factors that would predispose Shias and Sunnis to answer these questions in ways that are systematically different, uh, which I'm sure my co-panelists are very well placed to comment on. But let me just highlight one factor, which I think is at play here, which is simply that being a religious minority in Pakistan means that for Shias, the perceived pressure of giving socially desirable answers is much greater than that felt by Sunnis. And this is probably one factor that explains why there's such a divergence in the answers between those groups. Uh, looking at religion more closely, some of our results go against the conventional wisdom. For example, in terms of self-reported relig religiosity, uh, we observe few differences between respondents who tended to pray frequently and go to mosque compared to those who did not. Among respondents from Punjab, those who attended religious seminaries were actually more predisposed to agree with our tolerance statements on issues like intermarriage and communal violence than those who would attend public schools or state-funded schools. Um, beyond issues of identity and, and sectarian politics, we found other significant predictors of tolerance, including some surprises. Uh, for example, amongst our strongest and most consistent finding is that in our survey, wealthier Pakistanis were less likely to agree as strongly with our statements compared to poor Pakistanis. This is with the exception of the question of intermarriage. Uh, in Punjab and Quetta, Shia and, Shias and Sunnis who had more frequent daily interactions with each other, also, who also expressed confidence in their leaders, tended to agree with our pro-tolerance statements at higher rates, especially on the question of violence. So I mean, by way of conclusion, at least for, for my part, uh, let me just say that I think the key takeaway here is that holding intolerant opinions about another group a people does not necessarily imply a straightforward connection with uh, predisposition to participate in acts of violence. But I think what this does help shed, such, shed some light on is that popular opinion does often constrain the range of policy interventions that are feasible. Uh, and this is often the case in Pakistan on issues of public policy, and particularly on the issue of the protection of minority groups. Um, so I just want to add two things to what Michael said. Uh, the first is that the predictors of tolerance that we found were not consistent between Kuwaita and Punjab, which may not necessarily be surprising because obviously the context in Kuwaita is quite distinct from what we've seen in Punjab over the last few years. But one surprising finding, in my opinion, was that while greater education was a predictor for increased tolerance in Kuwaita, that wasn't the case in Punjab. We also find that people who have witnessed forms of victimization, either a family or friends or just witnessed individuals being victimized by militant groups, those individuals in Kuwaita were much more likely to express greater forms of tolerance, which is maybe much more like according to like what we would expect the finding to be. The second thing I want to point out is that there was great variation across districts in Punjab. 
So we don't have the sample size to, in, to reach definitive conclusions, but it's worth just exploring the numbers slightly. So for example, in a rural area in Punjab, a district called Bhawalpur, 90% of our respondents said that they were against intersectarian marriage. That's not necessarily surprising given um, our priors about what rural areas in South Punjab are like. But Musafargar, which is quite a similar district in many ways, had much higher numbers who were in favor of intersectarian marriage. Um, we, again, like I said, we don't have the numbers to really reach definitive conclusions, but it is interesting to note that preliminary statistical analysis that we did on levels of education across districts and number of violent incidents in districts were not predictors. So there is something else going on which explains this great variation across districts, and I think that's definitely worthy of um, future study. Um, maybe continuing along in a speculative vein, could either of you, um, in your field research or uh, study of, of other literature sources or to the extent that this came out in your survey itself, um, speak to, is there a sense that this problem, uh, th these levels of intolerance are changing? Uh, has it been getting worse? Is that something that came out or? Um, yes, maybe I'll start with that. Uh, unfortunately, Pakistan isn't a particularly data rich um, country, so we don't have attitudinal data from the last 10 years on how Sunnis feel towards Shias or vice versa. So it's really hard to say um, too much, even of course our survey was done just one, at one point in time. But um, I noticed this one data point from a Pew survey that between 2013 and 2014, the number of Pakistanis who described Sunni-Shia relations as being a very big problem decreased by 20 percentage points. So of course that's only one year, but that's maybe something to suggest that there's like a desensitizing to the types of problems that we see around us. And it'd be interesting to see what the results for next year are if this question is repeated. Um, and if I could just speculate beyond the data, I was just in Pakistan, I returned um, about 10 days ago, um, and there are two observations that I'd like to point to. The first is that I feel as if there is a far greater um, anti-Shia propaganda that's permissible in the country than there was previously. So we find that, for example, in Islamabad, while I was there, there was a huge um, rally held by the ASWJ, which um, RF support talks about. I'm sure we'll talk about it later on. It's an anti-Shia militant group. And right outside the r rally, um, there was a lot of propaganda and material and flags and even like clothing being distributed. Um, and the material doesn't really shy away from being pretty explicitly anti-Shia. It's not necessary, it does stop from explicitly condoning violence, but um, it is, it's reason of being is being anti-Shia. Um, so that's one point. Um, there's also a mosque in the center of the city. They have a bookshop that hands out this material for not a lot of, um, not a lot of rupees. Uh, I got a few of those. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to mention was that if you speak about Punjab specifically, in rural Punjab, we're seeing a situation whereby the old structures of power are breaking down, um, which allows for local clerics to have greater influence. So I'd say like 20 or 30 years ago, these kinship networks known as biradri and economic networks of you know like feudalism and big landlords were two of the main power structures. Mosques and mosques and clerics in rural areas did not have a lot of influence. They were part of the considered part of this like kami biradri not high, um, high in their ordering. Um, but as they've, you know, we can talk about the reasons Saudi influence, money, jihad money, et cetera, these clerics have started to gain influence and money. And that's also increased the amount of influence that they have in the areas. Um, and so that's, again, I think pointing towards maybe um, a change in the last few years. Yeah, I think um, pivoting off of that to Arv's paper, which does look uh, quite closely um, both in this shorter brief and but particularly the forthcoming uh, Middle East Institute report, looks quite closely at um, how these organizations, which perhaps are operating within this broader sort of social discourse um, regarding tolerance or intolerance, but um, particularly these, these organizations, clerical groups or, um, or other groups, um, Operate and, and potentially contribute and shape some of this, uh, some of these attitudes and certainly many of the actions uh, that we've seen. Um, I was wondering if RF, if you could um, sort of give us maybe the concise uh, version of sort of the major, uh, the major groups or major sort of areas, flashpoints of conflict that you see, um, and and uh, and uh, where are they recruiting from, where are they uh, getting their base of support from, and and where are the major threats um, in terms of active conflict? 
Uh, thank you, Colin. Uh, before I answer your question, I'd like to thank USIP for uh, their financial support for my research project. And also would like to, as a, an observer of the region, I'd like to thank them for supporting Neil Fur and uh, Michael's report because it really advances the discourse and brings in a lot of uh, much needed empirical data and uh, data about uh, social attitudes that may or may not impact uh, the violence that was the, uh, the focus of my report. Uh, so what I'd like to do is actually just kind of briefly go through the, the who, what, where, why, how um, of uh, sectarian violence in Pakistan and then get into the so what um, and, and the implications, you know, what does it really matter? Um, now, my report focused on the resurgence of uh, sectarian violence in Pakistan and specifically Sunni Diobandi Shia. So commonly we refer to the violence as a Sunni Shia violence. But in Pakistan, there are three major uh, Sunni subsects, the Brelvis, who are sort of uh, neo-traditionalists, uh, the Diobandis, um, who are somewhat reformed uh, traditionalists, and the Ahl Hadith, who are very similar to what are known as the Wahhabis or the Salafis, who are predominant in, in the Gulf Arab states. Um, and so uh, the conflict between Sunnis and Shias in Pakistan at least as it manifests in the form of um, violent networks and sectarian entrepreneurs and agitators, is really between one Sunni subsect, uh, the Diobandis, and, uh, and the Shia. Um, mainly the, the, the predominant Shia 12 er um, sa subsect, but also uh, smaller uh, Shia groups such as the, um, the, Isma the various Ismaili groups are also targets of violence, but don't really um, respond uh, in, in the form of retaliatory violence. So uh, my report investigates the resurgence um, uh, of sectarian violence, or Sunni Diobandi Shia sectarian violence in Pakistan, the causes uh, and the implications. And so between 2007 and 2013, uh, the time period in which my database uh, covers, um, approximately 2,300 Pakistanis were killed in uh, attacks that are confirmed or suspected uh, Sunni Diobandi and Shia sectarian attacks. That's in the, in the four major provinces. Uh, now, um, there was also another war in the Kurram Agency, which is one of the seven tribal areas. Uh, and between 2007 and 2011, an estimated 1,500 people were killed uh, in what was a, a tribal war that uh, bled very much into uh, the, the spreading Taliban insurgency and also had a lot to do with what was going on across the border in Pakistan. So uh, the, uh, the tendency um, is to you know, focus on Punjab, uh, Punjab as the center of sectarianism in Pakistan. But uh, as my data set indicates and, and other um, interviews and other um, uh, anecdotal data indicates, uh, sectarianism has uh, become mainstream to a large degree nationwide. And so um, we have, uh, from the period of 2007 to 2013, we have four major zones of sectarian violence. Uh, there are Balochistan, uh, which is a province that borders Iran and Afghanistan. Um, <coughs> uh, Karachi, which is Pakistan's largest city. Uh, the Kurram Agency and surrounding areas, um, the Arakzai Agency, and then some neighboring or nearby or adjacent uh, districts in the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province, such as Hangu. Um, and then finally, Punjab. But by 2013, the most active zones of sectarian or Sunni Diobandi Shia sectarian violence in Pakistan were Balochistan and Karachi. If you look at the data, um, the amount of casualties as a result of Sunni Diobandi Shia violence in Pakistan had largely remained flat in Punjab. So this is the area in which um, uh, <clears throat> sectarian activism and sectarian violence had really been birthed in Pakistan in the late 1970s in respect to Sunni, Sunni Diobandis and Shias. Uh, this is the area in which the, the, the phenomenon of sectarianism had really been born. Um, and yet, um, from this period, 2007 to 2013, um, violence has largely remained uh, sort of s stable um, in terms of the trend lines in Punjab. And the most active zones of violence were Balochistan and Karachi. And we don't see much violence, uh, significant trends of violence in Gilgit-Baltistan and interior Sindh, uh, 
um, you know, these two er other areas that have been sectarian flashpoints inside Pakistan. And uh, that's for a variety of reasons, but in Gilgit Baltistan, there was, um, you know, previous flare up in 2004, and that had kind of been dealt with by uh, local actors, including the political administration. But uh, so the question is, who are the, the perpetrators of this violence? Who are the networks behind this? And uh, on the Sunni side, it's essentially um, uh, Sunni Diobandi militant networks that come from a variety of groups. And so there is um, you know, the prime anti-Shia um, group in Pakistan, which is known as Sipai Sahaba Pakistan. Uh, it was founded in uh, 1985. And, uh, and then uh, after 9-11, it changed its name to Ahl Sunnat al Jamaat. So uh, from now, I'll call it ASWJ, just shorthand. So the ASWJ is the prime uh, agitational group. It's also a political party. Uh, its members uh, come on Pakistani talk shows, um, engage in electoral alliances with Pakistani politicians. And so uh, it's also a band organization. So it has uh, its foot in multiple worlds. And it's also, uh, especially since uh, 2010 or so, has played a very prominent uh, social role, uh, at least in terms of sectarianism in Pakistan. So ahl sunnat wal jamaat or the ASWJ, is the main uh, agitational or political group. And then there's lashkar e jangvi which is a so-called splinter group of the SSP or ASWJ. It was emerged in 1996. Um, and you know, before 9-11, and even more so after 9-11, it has grown increasingly tied to al-Qaeda and anti-state militant jihadists. And then finally, there's the TTP, the Tehrik Taliban Pakistan. Um, and what all these groups have in common is that they are Sunni Diobandi. And so, you know, somebody might um, begin as an, uh, as an activist within Sipai Sahaba Pakistan or SSP or ASWJ, and then uh, move within that trajectory into another more radical group, such as the TTP, and uh, join the anti-state insurgency. Uh, yet that animus towards the Shia will still remain. And so you have Qari Hussein Masood, who was a major uh, commander for the Pakistani Taliban, had formerly been a member of Lashkar e Jangvi, and then used his uh, same uh, skills for um, training or recruiting suicide bombers who would target the Pakistani state as well as Shias. So there is this uh, kind of duality uh, to uh, Sunni Diobandi militancy. On the Shia side, uh, there is a, has been a, a reemergence of uh, what is known as Sipai Muhammad Pakistan. Uh, it is uh, sort of the Shia version of Lashkar e Jangvi, but and we can get into this later. You know, Shia um, activists, even if they are sectarian, don't necessarily engage in bona fide anti-Sunni rhetoric. And so, uh, the SMP, Sipai Muhammad Pakistan, is largely um, restricted itself to uh, retributional violence. Uh, it sometimes goes beyond that parameters, but not too far. But that's the major uh, Shia uh, militant group. Um, it's not as organized as the Sunni militant groups, but it, it, it exists. Uh, and also, there are some members of some mainstream Pakistani political parties, uh, such as the Mutahad al-Qawmi movement or the MQM, which uh, some of their targeted killers are believed to be, have, be involved in, in some of the um, sectarian violence that takes place in Karachi. Uh, so they might uh, work on behalf of the MQM in the day, and then at night, if they're um, Shias, they might engage in some violence that reflects their sectarian tendencies as well. So uh, what we have are these four major zones of violence. They all have their own local reasons for why they've emerged. In the Quorum Agency, there are um, tensions. There have been historic tensions between uh, uh, tribes, some of which are uh, Sunni, and one is Shia. And that kind of bled into the spreading Taliban insurgency and violence there has, been, has waned uh, once that insurgency uh, uh, died down or was contained to some degree by the military. Uh, in Karachi, the violence is, um, you know, is, is manifests itself in the form of targeted killings as well as these mass casualty attacks that target Shia processions or uh, even residential communities. And so, um, uh, in Karachi, um, you know, much of the violence actually kind of uh, blends into the background of the, 
the, the general noise of uh, violent noise that happens in Karachi. There are generally targeted killings that happen on a regular basis there, and so uh, they can happen for all sorts of reasons and um, kind of lose sight that much of that is sectarian. Uh, so there are these local networks um, and that uh, kind of leverage uh, these uh, these local tensions, and uh, they also build off of national and, and transnational trends and uh, and icons and symbols. And so, for example, in Balochistan, you know, the tendency is to kind of believe that uh, look at it as uh, violence there as having been exported from Punjab, and that there are let's say ethnic Punjabis that are in involved in this uh, violence against the Shia in the Balochistan province. But if you look at uh, the Lashkar Jangvi militant group or the terrorist group Lashkar Jangvi, its major commanders in Balochistan are all ethnic Baloch. And so um, this phenomenon of anti-Shia violence or uh, sectarianism has been indigenized um, in many parts of the country, including in Balochistan. And then, uh, just quickly, uh, uh, the so what aspect. Um, you know, Pakistan is unlikely to see a type of Iraq-style scenario where the country is you know, bifurcated um, in a de facto or de jure sense along sectarian lines. Um, the level of sectarian animus has not risen to that level. Also, the populations are quite mixed uh, in most of the country, except for, let's say, the Quorum Agency. Um, and <coughs> Uh, so, you know, the, the country is unlikely to see that type of, uh, you know, worst case scenario. But, um, you know, we'll have continued, uh, there will be the continued loss of innocent human life. And um, slowly what we are seeing is also the, the narrowing of the idea of who is a, a full citizen in Pakistan. So, you know, originally Pakistan was conceived as a homeland for the subcontinent's Muslims uh, and uh, a non-sectarian homeland. So. The, the Pakistan Muslim League, which had founded you know, the state of Pakistan or had led the movement for the state of Pakistan, had really kind of tried to ignore the intra-Muslim divisions, whether it was between the Sunnis and the Shias or within the Sunnis or between even you know, Sunni and Shia Muslims and the Ahmadis. Um, and you know, as we've seen in Pakistan's history, that kind of concept of uh, who is a Muslim and, and to a large extent who is a Pakistani, because the two are kind of correlated, has narrowed. And so the Ahmadis were pushed out of that fold, and uh, these anti-Shia activists really you know, tried to leverage that momentum and do the same to the Shias. Uh, they've largely been unsuccessful in terms of the, uh, the law of the land, but I think um, you know, this radicalization that is happening in many of the parts of the country, uh, along with the violence, uh, pushes the country in that direction in a, a de jure sense. So I'll, uh, I'll wrap I'll close at that. Um, I think that's definitely some points that we'd like to come back to um, later on in the discussion. But before we uh, do, I, I wanted to bring in Sar Hung here to talk a little bit more about the comparative perspective um, uh, in Iraq and, and maybe elsewhere in the greater Middle East. Um, as our notes in his report and uh, mentioned, uh, many Pakistani sectarian actors do seem to draw some inspiration um, from the conflicts that we see going on in the Middle East right now, which have their own, um, in some cases, quite explicit sectarian uh, tinge, uh, in other cases less so. But um, I was wondering, Sarhang, if you could speak to a, a little bit um, on those sort of the developments in the Middle East right now, um, how how you see those shaping up along if, if a sectarian lens is an appropriate means uh, uh, for analysis. Um, and, and then maybe we can talk more about sort of how that's traced back into Pakistan. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Um, I don't have a research to share, but what uh, the insights that I will share is uh, basically coming from uh, living uh, most of it firsthand. I'm originally from Iraq, so uh, growing up, uh, uh, I, I, I heard so many times if Saddam Hussein is gone, uh, then uh, hell's doors will open and the Sunni Shia fight will start. And I'm talking about the early 1980s. Um, and uh, the second uh, part of what I'll say is informed by my work, working uh, at the Institute on Iraq, uh, trying to um, uh, uh, prevent violence or find nonviolent means to resolve uh, differences in that part of the world, Iraq and the wider uh, Middle East. Uh, today, so 
uh, today, if you look at Iraq and if you look at Syria, you have a violent conflict uh, raging in, in both countries. Uh, they have merged pretty much. Uh, uh, there were, for, for many people, they were in denial that those uh, conflicts ha have merged in so many ways until uh, the organization, the so-called Islamic State, or as many other people call it ISIL or ISIS, uh, basically took large swaths of land in Iraq and uh, expanding its territorial control uh, in both uh, Syria and Iraq, uh, close to, starting close from the Iranian uh, border all the way to the uh, deep heart of, uh, of, of Syria, and uh, having control over some eight uh, million uh, populations, control over uh, oil and all of that. And the question is, is this sectarian violence, is this uh, Sunni Shia? And uh, uh, going back to the question of, um, the, my childhood question, would, would that be true? And growing up, uh, th there is a difference between what people say and what people do. And that's my observation. Uh, you ask the Iraqis, uh, everybody will say, you know, we are one people, one nation, we are brothers, sisters. And still, when you look around, you see a lot of killing. Uh, so somebody must be doing that killing and must be for a reason. Um, and then as the Syria uh, uh, conflict uh, unfolded, uh, then it, this changed the question of, okay, did what we see in Iraq was a result of the U.S. intervention or actually there is a deeper uh, problem there? Uh, and as you go uh, further, uh, if you look at uh, Libya and if you look at uh, Egypt, where, the, uh, where we don't have the issue of Sunni Shia and you still have uh, violence, then the larger question becomes, why do we see violence? Difference is fine as long as it's resolved uh, nonviolently. So as we look into the, the, the uh, issue, it's, it's important to uh, make those differences. And also the question of why does it matter uh, for the rest of the world if, these, if this is, is this a uh, 14th century long problem that is localized and it's other people's problem, why should we be part of this? I think it's an important question that many people I get uh, ask a lot. Uh, why should we care? Uh, it's an internal issue. Um, so, the and I, as I was uh, reading the reports that uh, the other panelists presented uh, in Iraq, the, the violence and the loss of life that you see probably in Pakistan in in one year, that number of casualties you see in a month in Iraq, uh, sometimes in a, in a matter of couple of uh, a couple of weeks, uh, in one attack of the Islamic State on a camp, they killed 1,700. They, on one attack on a prison, they killed six, uh, 600. On one attack uh, on a tribe, on a tribe, they killed 250. So the numbers are are huge, and uh, why this is happening uh, is is important. Uh, Yes, there is a sectarian tone uh, in, in the violence in Iraq and in, in Syria, but the problem is deeper than that. Uh, as I said, if you look at Egypt and if you look at Libya, uh, the, the, the question becomes different. Um, the religious institutions, um, uh, for example, the Grand uh, Ayatollah uh, Ali al-Sistani, the Grand Shia Marja'iya, uh, has been uh, a political player in Iraq, but he tried to maintain a distance and try to, uh, to keep it calm. Uh, uh, but uh, there are other uh, uh, others, like you have Shia militias and you have uh, Sunni militias that are fighting. And the conflict in Syria today, uh, the Islamic State, Jabhat al-Nusra, uh, are uh, predominantly, um, actually Sunni uh, 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 extremists who are fighting uh, in those countries. Um, the declared, uh, uh, and if you have heard the recent statement from uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the self-proclaimed caliphate of, uh, of the Islamic State, uh, and others uh, from uh, um, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi when he was leading al-Qaeda in Iraq, in the mid-2000s, uh, uh, mid uh, they, they uh, directed their, their violence toward the Shia uh, to a large extent before they directed to, uh, to the state or to they, before they directed to the Americans. And they, um, uh, the term Rafida, uh, the, the, those who reject the Shia, they, um, uh, or so, sorry, the, the term that they use uh, for the, the Shia, uh, is uh, is increasing among them, and uh, that's what the image that they promote. 
so it is understandable for a violent terrorist organization to do this because violence is their means. Uh, but it gets more complicated when politicians, uh, for uh, political electoral gains, uh, feed into into the sectarian uh, sectarian narrative. Uh, when you have the former prime minister of Iraq, uh, Prime Minister Nur al-Maliki, come on TV and say. Today, the battle that is being fought uh, in Iraq uh, and in Syria is the same battle between uh, uh, Hussein and Yazid uh, that as the Battle of Karbala. Uh, that is bringing and infusing history back into uh, into that uh, conversation. Uh, I don't think uh, m most of the Iraqi politicians and uh, in private conversation they keep saying that we are not sectarian. We don't believe in sectarian sectarianism yet. Uh, when you see those this much killing, you, you hear your state, their statements, uh, you see the opposite of that. Uh, whether they are sectarian or not, they are definitely playing into the sectarian identities. Uh, they are trying to ch to uh, to take uh, to uh, use that for political gains. And uh, today, uh, the the uh, pretty much most of the uh, the, the Sunni pr populations are either displaced. Uh, about uh, some two million of them, uh, or uh, they are under the control of the Islamic State. Uh, and th this applies to much uh, of Syria as well. Uh, those people, uh, uh, some sided with the, uh, with the Islamic State uh, because they believe in their ideology. Those are the minority, uh, in minority, and uh, the vast majority because they disagreed with the policies of the Iraqi government that they called it a Shia-led government, an Iranian-backed uh, uh, government. Uh, so this brings the, the question of, uh, of the regional uh, dimensions into this. Uh, Iraq and Syria, uh, today you have, you have a proxy war uh, between uh, militias on both sides, on the Sunni side and the Shia side, uh, supported by uh, different uh, regional uh, countries. Um, uh, even if you, uh, so, now this confluence and this entanglement uh, of these problems, uh, the way you deal about it, uh, there is somewhat of an international paralysis about it. Uh, yes, there is a declared international strategy to deal with it, and I uh, understand there is a section that uh, you're coming back to it, uh, and I'll probably say uh, uh, more about it there. Uh, but uh, today, uh, the, the violence in Iraq uh, is very much driven by governance issues that politicians put a sectarian cover over it. Uh, religious leaders, um, in it, the, the, the Shia religious leadership uh, has been strong in Grand Ayatollah Sistani, uh, but in the past few years he has seen others challenge that authority gradually on the street level. Uh, when you had uh, the Muqtad al-Sadr form the militia of Jaysh al-Mahdi, when you had Asaib al-Haq uh, forming another, uh, and, uh, and others uh, that you've heard probably about, uh, then this is where a dilemma uh, comes for uh, the Grand Ayatollah that tried to stay out of politics. Uh, after June, the takeover of the Islamic State of many parts of Iraq, it was Grand Ayatollah Sistani who actually called the Shia to take up arms and go fight uh, the Islamic State. And that, that was a surprise for many, many people uh, because that was contrary to the role he played. He tried to not to take sides of who is a prime minister, who is in government, but actually he sided this time against uh, Prime Minister Maliki because he uh, felt that he uh, pursued the wrong policies. Um, that changing role, we don't know where it will end. Uh, probably a few years ago, uh, the Grand Ayatollah did not see himself one day calling people to take up arms to defend something. Uh, but remembering, uh, and I, I, I followed up on this, uh, remembering the 2006 uh, explo uh, of the, the, the blowing up the Askaria uh, mosque that the reports uh, also cited, uh, it, it, it triggered, uh, there are triggers, uh, there is a point even for a community that doesn't see itself in a conflict, there, what are the triggers that could take you to levels uh, that you did not think it was possible? Uh, so as you look at the Pakistan uh, example, I think identifying what could be that uh, is, a, is a good and preventative thing. Uh, to this time, Sistani ordered the Shia to go on so that he will prevent another Askariya uh, incident. Uh, so if the, 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 the shrines of uh, al Hussein or Imam uh, Ali were blown up or, or reached in, uh, in, in Karbala and Najaf, uh, then there would have been no ending to, if we have a manageable uh, crisis or conflict today, uh, 
uh, that would have taken it to a level uh, that there was no comeback from. Uh, that was a painful decision, I'm sure, for him, but uh, this is a situation that is no one actor uh, controls, and that is a, 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 that is a problem that uh, collectively we need to think about, about how do we address those, and uh, I'll, I'll pause here. Sure, I guess, I mean, certainly, so one parallel between the experience in Iraq or, or elsewhere in, in Pakistan then seems to be this um, uh, more openly sectarian um, political discourse and, and actors more openly identifying, at least at least the situation in Iraq seems to be further along uh, than Pakistan, but um, more, more actively identifying uh, they're, uh, or at least publicly identifying along sectarian lines. Um, and, and as you mentioned, the case of religious actors previously not perhaps at the forefront of politics taking a more active role, which certainly you see in, in Pakistan, as, um, as Arf mentioned. Um, I was wondering, uh, if all of you, I think, could speak a little bit more to the role of politics in this and, um, whether, in the case, as, as Arif mentioned, um, ASWJ uh, in Pakistan, at least, uh, despite being banned, despite the links it has with militant sectarian, um, violent sectarian actors, um, is actively involved uh, in, in politics and fielding candidates, um, forging alliances with other parties. Uh, is, this, uh, is this necessary to... Uh, diffuse violent competition to bring these actors into a political process of sorts? Um, or is this sort of the first step towards a more explicitly sectarian political conflict that bleeds into active all-out conflict, as, as may be the case elsewhere? Any of you want to take on that? So um, I've heard this argument being used before when in 2002 the Coalition of Islamist Parties, the MMA, was brought into power in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province. A lot of people were worried and then a lot of other people said that perhaps there will be a normalization of their politics if we bring them into the political mainstream. Um, and so some people saw that their tenure in KP was an indication of the latter. So we didn't see really... Uh, you know, increase of Talibanization per se in KP. There were a few cosmetic changes like billboards, women's pictures weren't allowed in, but a lot of people would say that life on KP under the secular Pashtun party, the ANP, and this Islamist coalition, the MMA, was not perhaps that different after all. I think that the case with the ASWJ is completely different. I think it's really important that we not confuse um, what the ASWJ is and what political parties that are right of the political mainstream are. The ASWJ is, as I've pointed out, um, they fall under this umbrella of the Sipai Sahaba SSP. Um, they have very clear linkages to the LEJ, which has very clear linkages to the TTP, which is responsible for all the violence that we see in Pakistan or the vast majority of it. And I think it's really difficult um, to disentangle this. We never really know. Um, who the perpetrators are just because the linkages are so um, so clear. And so I think that even though the ASWJ did contest elections um, and it doesn't itself propagate violence, um, its mandate is very clearly against what's supposed to be the constitution of Pakistan, right? So it doesn't want Shias in public office. It says that very clearly. It doesn't mince words about it, the, what it thinks the role of Shias in Pakistan is. And this is, again, I'm not a proponent of the jamaat e islami or the JUIF, but it is different from the jamaat e islami and the JUIF. And I think it's clear that we make these demarcations because I think the political mainstream in Pakistan should allow for certain actors who fall on either side of the ideological spectrum, but it needs to also um, have a dividing line. And I think ASWJ falls on the other side of the dividing line. Uh, is it fair to say that ASWJ or uh, Lashkari Jangvi's goals are uh, t state takeover, or are they looking to, uh, are they, are they, uh, is it possible for them to work within the state, or is their goal ultimately just reshaping the state entirely? Well, uh, what Lashkar Jangvi and Ahle Sunnat Bul Jamaat, or ASWJ, share is an animus towards the Shia. So the ASWJ would, at the very least, like to uh, 
uh, curtail Shia public activity and reduce their their you know their um, religious processions to or confine them to private space. Um, they'd also like to. Um, some forces within the ASWJ also advocate uh, declaring Shia as a non-Muslim minority, and so that would, um, you know, disenfranchise them in um, in many different ways. Um, and the LEJ shares those goals, but its a primary me primary method of achieving that is through violence. So the violence is used to intimidate Shia populations, subdue them, um, force them to uh, either flee the country or to uh, live in predominantly Shia areas. Um, ASWJ uh, has no aspirations for state takeover. It's impossible. Um, but uh, they do say that you know, if Iran can be uh, a Shia state, why can't Pakistan be a Sunni state? So um, you know, in some ways, they do um, comment on the broader state identity and do want it to conform to a view that is consistent with their own. Um, Lashkar Jangvi or elements within Lashkar Jangvi have, um, have um, you know, consistently gone into that anti-state trajectory and have uh, joined forces with Al-Qaeda, with uh, the Tehrik al-Taliban Pakistan, the TTP, and have joined this anti-state jihad. And so, you know, they very much, uh, many for elements within Lashkar Jangvi uh, very much do, uh, are keen on takeover of the state, but that is, um, you know, part of a joint effort in which um, the TTP and now possibly Al Qaeda's um, new affiliate in South Asia would be at, at the front lines. And um, if I might. I think there are, there are two dynamics here that I think we should sort of appreciate in thinking about how politics interacts with sectarianism in Pakistan. I think one is clearly um, uh, within Pakistan, the political institutions and how various parties and organizations feed off of each other. And there is also this sort of broader regional element, which I think Sarhang was mentioning. If I can just uh, add to some of those points, I mean, you know, Shias and Sunnis have lived in Pakistan for, for centuries and have not had chronic endemic violence. So there, there are things that have happened we can actually point to and think about you know, what are the conditions under which this happens. And I think one of them, historically at least, in the 70s was um, a, a challenge to the state's legitimacy in Pakistan uh, and the Iranian Revolution, which politicized uh, Shia identity uh, across the Middle East and more broadly. Um, I think that's, that's one regional component that has fed into uh, much more localized struggles in Pakistan. Uh, and the second one, I think, uh, sort of in a very concrete sense, if we're trying to understand the, the regional dimension to, to sectarianism in Pakistan, is to appreciate the, the intimacy of uh, Pakistan's foreign relationship with, with Saudi Arabia, uh, particularly during the tenure of Nawaz Sharif. Um, <clears throat> this is, a, I think, I would call it a very strategic relationship between these two countries. Uh, each uses their own... Um, Pakistan has its, its, its military and, and, and population pro to offset the, the, the to use a, to, this is a sort of synergy between the financial capacity of Saudi Arabia and, and the military prowess of Pakistan. Uh, and they've cooperated very closely for 30 years. And uh, apart from, from just issues of military and on, on, a, on several different uh, um, bases, they, they work very closely together. Uh, and this has also led to, uh, I think, the sectarian issue being sort of a proxy for many other interests. Uh, so at times it is between it's a regional brinksmanship between um, Saudi Arabia and Iran, which at times extends into Pakistan. Uh, so just to say that I think there, there are very local issues at play here uh, that obey very local forms of politics and interests that also overlap at times with a much broader regional dimension. And it's, it's really trying to figure out how these two intersect uh, that I think it would help us understand uh, the future of this issue. So, Hong, um, do you have a sense of, uh, from the perspective of these other sectarian uh, groups, like maybe ISIS or or other groups operating in the greater Middle East, is is Pakistan on their radar? Is that is 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 the is there a risk that active sectarian combatants in other parts of the Islamic world will eventually shift their attention to Pakistan, or is that? Um, or is it more a pull coming from the other direction? Um, I think we need to look at this from the perspective of not only today, but long term. Uh, in the nine, in 2000, uh, it was the first uh, probably 
uh, Islamic terrorist um, organization that popped up on the border uh, of the Kurdistan region of Iraq, which is which has stayed away for the most part from the sectarian Sunni Shia tensions. Uh, Kurds, an ethnic group, uh, they're mostly Sunni Muslim, but they stayed out of this tension. And this, you had this called, uh, at, the, at the beginning it's called Jund al-Islam, then changed its name uh, to Ansar al-Islam, uh, and then gradually uh, became the leaders of al-Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, some of them are now the top leaders uh, in, of the Islamic State. Uh, when some of those people were captured or the, that organization was studied, uh, it, 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 they found out that they got their um, Islamic education in Pakistan, they, did their, they acquired their uh, fighting experience in Afghanistan, and they brought that uh, to the Kurdistan region from which continued to Iraq. Uh, today we see it go uh, to, seen it to, uh, go to Syria. Uh, we don't know where they will go. Uh, we've seen Chechnya which is today in, in, the, in, in the ranks of uh, the Islamic State. You have Chechens uh, uh, coming and, and, and fighting uh, there. Uh, so there is mobility here uh, for these fighters. So the issue of sectarianism, the issue uh, is an issue that goes up and down depending, and it, it intersects with other uh, issues. So I think looking at beyond just the news cycle uh, of these issues, just beyond the political cycles of, of, of elections, uh, at the long term, how does this uh, change? Uh, we have the experience of the Taliban, we have the experience of Al-Qaeda, we have the experience uh, of the Islamic State. I think we need to uh, take a, a, look at a, longer, a longer term. Many countries felt that they are, these are issues that are far away until you had 9-11. Uh, again, then you felt, uh, people felt that it has been contained uh, until uh, you had the Islamic State actually a pulling uh, fighters not only from uh, from uh, Muslim countries but actually uh, from Western countries and that is where uh, I see a lot of surprise from the, the decision makers of these countries how did this happen how do we deal with this so this is a problem it's not necessarily um, it has changed it is it has a pull that it, it pulls fighters from elsewhere uh, but it also has the factor that it can either export fighters to other places, these people could go back to the, those countries, and this is the biggest worry uh, for a lot of policymakers uh, in, in many countries. And you have some 60 countries who have, uh, at least some 60 countries who have representations in the ranks of the, uh, representation is a bad word, but it has fighters uh, in, 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 uh, in the ranks of the Islamic State. Uh, today, we see ideas uh, of the Islamic State migrating using technology, using modern day way of communication. Uh, so it is not only the, fa the fighters that may go back to, to, to Pakistan, but an idea. Uh, when you have the, uh, uh, I think it was the uh, Pakistani Taliban that says, okay, they, they did not pledge allegiance uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the Islamic State, but they have expressed support. Uh, when you have in Libya, uh, it's not the Islamic State that went to Libya, but actually it was a, a local uh, network of uh, terrorism that actually pledged allegiance to uh, the Islamic uh, uh, State. So it, 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 it is tough. It's, it, it, could, it could take many forms, and the, the, the migration of the idea is more uh, dangerous than the migration of the fighters. But in this interconnected, intermingled, intermarried, inter whatever terms you can continue, uh, this is a bigger problem, and there is an interest to, to look at this more broadly. Um, I do want to get to questions from the audience uh, pretty soon, but uh, I guess maybe just following up a little bit on, before we do, on sort of government responses uh, to this threat, um, since, as Sarhang says, it's it's a concern for many nations, um, Pakistan among them. Um, I guess, um, uh, to what extent, and this sort of to all the panelists, um, to what extent does the Pakistani state recognize sectarianism or sectarian conflict as a significant challenge, given all the other challenges that they face? Um, what is their what is their response been, um, uh, and and what what is needed um, in terms of a response to uh, prevent uh, an escalation of this conflict? Uh, okay, um, so I think that this question kind of fits broadly into the the flawed narrative of the good Taliban versus the bad Taliban in Pakistan, which is the idea that 
Um, some groups are looking to overthrow the Pakistan state, and so we don't like them, and so we're going to tackle them. The other groups, if they're either fighting proxy wars with neighbors or doing things that might be a nuisance but don't directly challenge the Pakistan state, then we're okay with them. And I think, unfortunately, there hasn't been a recognition of this inner linkage that Arif was referring to earlier, earlier and that I mentioned. So there's this idea that, okay, it's not great that they're targeting Shias, but it's not directly challenging our presence as the Pakistan state, and so we're not going to treat this as as big a problem as some of the other groups in society. So that's the first point. The second point is that um, at the local level, there are linkages between political parties such as the Pakistan Muslim League and um, the ASWJ as it operates in Punjab. And this is because I think like very local level dynamics about how um, the power structures in rural Punjab are evolving so that in order to get votes from certain districts, the PMLN needs to um, have seat adjustments with these various actors or allow them quote unquote free passage in order to carry out their activities. And so I agree with Arif's earlier point that, um, you know, Punjab isn't really where sectarian violence is happening anymore. You know, you look at the numbers, it's happening in Balochistan, it's happening in Karachi, et cetera. But the reason that Punjab keeps coming up in the discussion is because this is where their groups are operating, and this is where, to some extent, the groups are being allowed to operate with the freedom that they are given. Well, I, I agree with Nilofer, and I think if you look at the, uh, the response of the Pakistani state, you know, it's, I think it would be um, you know, mistake to refer to it as a as a singular entity. So you have uh, the, the civilian government at the at the federation at the federal level, uh, the military within the military. You have you know uh, the ISI and military intelligence, and then you have the provincial governments. Uh, so there has been you know to some to some extent a devolution of power, and so there are these uh, varying responses to sectarian militant actors uh, inside the country. So as Nilofer had uh, referenced, there is. Um, you know, effectively a, uh, a deal um, between uh, the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz and uh, the Ahl Sunnat al Jamaat organization. So that began in about uh, 2010 or so. Um, and, you know, some people who are associated with the party claim that it's not a, you know, a hard deal. But what we've seen then, uh, since then, is that this group has operated um, with a great freedom publicly. And so, you know, they engage in hate speech um, through, uh, their, uh, through their, in their um, sermons and also in their public rallies. And the Pakistani state has the capacity to uh, prohibit this type of speech and arrest individuals who engage in such behavior. But in Punjab, it has decided to um, allow them to, um, uh, to act uh, publicly or be active publicly uh, for these, um, you know, political goals. Um, so there are these localized electoral alliances between uh, the ASWJ and the PMLN, but also between uh, the ASWJ and other political parties in Pakistan. So uh, members of the ASWJ have met with uh, senior officials of the PPP. Um, uh, they met with some members of the MQM. Uh, and so this is Pakistani politics in terms of uh, you know, the, the pragmatism and these um, localized single district alliances that are made by, um, let's say, an individual within, within a party. Uh, that can sort of graduate to what is effectively a sort of um, a, a larger level partnership between the ASWJ and the PMLN that exists right now. It might not exist in five years from now. It's not something that is, is that has um, indications that it is necessarily lasting. If you flash back about you know, to 1999, members of Lashkar Jangvi tried to kill Nawaz Sharif, who was prime minister then, and his brother, who was chief minister of Punjab, launched a very heavy crackdown on the LEJ. But, you know, the Pakistani state, elements of the Pakistani state are quite permissive towards sectarian actors, whether they are simply political actors or, you know, rise to that, um, to uh, militant activity. And uh, that has kind of emboldened um, anti-Shia militants in Punjab and uh, at a national level as well. I mean, I'll be brief. Um, I think uh, I think one has to look at um, as for why the state has developed this culture of permissibility. Uh, the reliance on these kind of militant groups to pursue foreign policy objectives uh, through unconventional means to deal with the uh, their conventional asymmetry 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis their more powerful neighbor. So I think we can look to that as one of the reasons why the state has often um, looked uh, askance or askew where these groups have operated. At times, they turn inward um, when issues of legitimacy are at stake. But uh, I think the, the fun, one of the fundamental drivers has to do with how decision makers in the Pakistani state see their, their national interests more broadly and how best to achieve them. And usually that's, or not usually, but sometimes in the absence of, of conventional parity, um, this is what happens. Okay, uh, with that, we'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, you all have mics for the most part, um, so, but please, if you could please raise your hand uh, and identify yourself and please give us a question. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, I think it's actually just a brief question, which is I'm curious to know the degree that there's coincidence between anti-Shia uh, groups that espouse anti-Shia views that uh, prosecute anti-Shia violence and those that uh, have anti-Sufi or uh, views or prosecute anti-Sufi violence. People that kill Shia in Pakistan? Are they the same people that kill Sufis in Pakistan? Or are they different people? Um, the and the anti there was a wave of anti Braille violence that had um, began in uh, around two thousand seven ish in Pakistan, uh, and has is subsided since around two thousand eleven two thousand twelve. And that was largely a part of the Talibanization process inside the country. So as the Taliban spread from uh, FATA, from the federally administered tribal areas, through KP and approached Punjab, and as uh, cells within the TTP network um, gained a presence in Karachi, parts of Punjab, and uh, parts of interior Sindh, they engaged in anti borelvi activity. It subsided since, and I think it's as a result of you know, the Taliban being pushed back into uh, a corridor of Fatah in terms of their hard physical presence. But I also think uh, that they had realized uh, there was a recognition of some, some elements within the TTP that the costs of uh, targeting uh, fellow Sunnis, even if they were you know, mis misguided and had um, you know, impure um, beliefs and practices, that the, the costs outweighed the benefits. And so I think uh, they made a decision um, uh, to pull away from that. And if you look at some of the documents that were um, seized from uh, bin Laden's house in Abdabad, uh, there is uh, some communication between elements in Al-Qaeda, uh, I think uh, including uh, bin Laden and maybe Adam Gadan, uh, writing to members of the TTP and telling them that you know attacks on mosques and these other type of places are not to our benefit you're exceeding your bounds, and so on and so forth. So I think it's, um, you know, uh, it's the, the TTP networks that were largely behind it, and not necessarily, um, you know, these expressly anti-Shia groups, but the lines are often quite blurred. Thank you for information. I'm uh, Seth Hassan from Afghanistan. So I have two questions. Uh, uh, from Arif, uh, I grew up in a, a Shia context, so I'm familiar with this uh, subsectoria that you said. But uh, mostly, it is said I was thinking that um, Sapai Sahaba and uh, Lashkar Jangavi is related to Wahhabi Salafi people. This is what most Shia in Afghanistan and Iran think. But you said they are related to Diobandi. Uh, uh, would explain more this for me. This is the first question. The second one is that: Is there any connection between the Diobandi of Pakistan and Diobandi of India? Because it seems Diobandi of India is more peaceful uh, ideology, have more peaceful ideology than Diobandi of Pakistan. Thank you. Those are two good questions. Um, I think. In respect to the first one, uh, when we look at the public discourse, the, the shorthand or the slang, um, the tendency is to use uh, the term Wahhabi to, uh, as, um, you know, to paint all sort of extremist actors as Wahhabi reflexively. Uh, but if you look at the doctrine, um, Sipai Sahaba is a, a Deobandi organization, um, and it is from that school of thought. 
and they're very much distinct from the Wahhabis or the Salafis, um, as they prefer to be called. And so um, the <coughs> the Obandis or the Sepai Sahaba, uh, people who are affiliated with the SSP or ASWJ, uh, follow a madhab, so they are Hanafi. Uh, the <coughs> um, the Wahhabis or the Salafis uh, don't, you know, they might be, uh, some might be Hanbali, but they tend to not uh, follow a madhab, and if they're in Pakistan uh, in particular. Um, there are other sort of, um, you know, indicators that show that they're the Ubandis, you know, what or, uh, madrasa they graduated from, um, what clerics they acknowledge. And so all, you know, all these uh, different indicators, and we can talk about in detail later, um, uh, point to them being the Ubandi. And so there is enough, um, you know, radical space within the Ubandi community in Pakistan uh, for them to, uh, you know, be part of this, um, be, be among the Diobandis. Uh, and there's diversity within the Diobandi community, but if you look at most militant groups inside Pakistan, they do come from that subsect. Uh, in respect to the divide or the differences between uh, the Diobandis in Pakistan and in India, um, you know, the Diobandis in India had uh, supported the uh, unity of India. So they were against the Pakistan movement. So they sided with the Congress party uh, which was the Indian nationalist movement. And um, those that remained in India were individuals who uh, did not believe in the, uh, in the bifurcation of, uh, of India. Uh, and they've largely remained committed uh, to the idea of India as a secular pluralist uh, government and society. Um, and their linkages to militant groups are quite minimal. So they often make public statements that are very much at odds with that of the Ubandis in Pakistan. Uh, and we have is, there is a, you know, a greater, uh, there is a conception of uh, sort of, you know, pan-Diobandism and Diobandi unity. And you have some Diobandi scholars who visit Pakistan and some Pakistani Diobandi scholars who visit India. And in fact, many of the uh, leading Diobandis in Pakistan had actually sided with the Congress and opposed the country's formation, but because of pragmatic politics, they'd you know, assimilated in the country. But when we look at militancy and extremism within the Diobandis in Pakistan, it's very distinct. Uh, there aren't these strong network connections to Diobandis in India. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Khalid Nadri. Um, I have a question about <clears throat> kind of the response of the state, Pakistani state, that um, Arif talked about and everyone actually talked about. Um, we know that there are Shia in the, in, the armed serv in the armed forces as well as parts of the police across Pakistan. Do you think that that's shaped or kind of modulated the behavior of the state um, to sectarian violence in Pakistan? And then also a second question, if I could invite uh, Michael and Nilfar to talk about this. Um, in many ways, you know, Afghanistan is a very, is a most different case from Pakistan. Um, but nonetheless, you know, a lot of the same treatments that have been applied to Pakistan over the past 30 years have applied to Afghanistan. But there's, of course, uh, we know that there's, uh, there's very high levels of, of social consociation in Afghanistan, despite those treatments. So I was wondering if, if one could talk about why the, Pakistan is different, um, why, you know, sectarianism has increased in Pakistan over time, but has, despite political conflict in Afghanistan, has remained, uh, social consociation remains more or less uh, the norm. Uh, I could speak to the second question more than the first one. Uh, it's a great question and a very interesting point, Khalid. Um, I think I would challenge you a little bit that they're the most different or that Hazaras and uh, the Shia in Afghanistan uh, have really enjoyed full consociational Inter, you know, harmony. Um, at times it's true, but I mean, there's also been cases, uh, you know, in, in the 90s during the Civil War, the Taliban committed all kinds of atrocious acts of ethnic cleansing. Um, <clears throat> the Hazara party mobilized along Shia lines. So I, I'm not really sure we can find in Afghanistan the, the counterfactual for Pakistan, so to speak. Um, so, I mean, I, I, that's, I, that's, <laughs> that's my short answer to you, actually. Thank you. Um, just to add to that, I, I saw this interesting statistic the other day. So um, according to Pew data, I think from 2012, only half of Pakistani Sunnis say that they believe that Shias are Muslim. 41% say they don't believe this. This is, Afghanistan is very different. 77 or 80% of Sunnis believe that um, Shias are Muslim. 
And they, I think their report said that for countries that have at least 6% Shia, that Pakistan has by far the lowest rate of acceptance of, of uh, Shias as Muslim by Sunnis. So this was really striking to me, particularly because we we're talking about the comparative perspective. Um, so while I, I do agree with Michael's caveat that perhaps you know, things aren't all like um, roses in Afghanistan, there is something particular about Pakistan right now which seems to be, you know, like driving these statistics. Um, but also it's true in non-Hazarat Shia, mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Uh, actually, if I could just follow up, I think I mean, there are a couple of things that, I mean, there are, in, in Pakistan there are Shia who are Hazara and those who are not, and I think there are the, the dynamics of, of conflict are different. Um, one thing I think that is worth remembering when we talk about this particular issue, Shia-Sunni relations in Pakistan is, the estimates, the demographic balance, uh, which is very different from Iraq, for example, and, and quite different from Afghanistan, where, I mean, the Shia really are largely a minority. Uh, I think it's, it's the dynamics of intercommunal relations are very different when uh, that minority exercises very little political power in most contexts. There are times when, in Afghanistan, the Hazara community, by dint of being mobilized and unified, can play the role of kingmaker sometimes. Um, so I think in, in Iraq, where the, the Shia were uh, a discriminated majority, that contained within itself the, the seeds of, of disaster. So I think, I mean, barring everything I just told you earlier, I think that this issue of the demographic balance is, is a real key driver of, of inter-sectarian relations. Uh, yes, uh, the issue of uh, the military and representation in the military in a, in a context where you have different communities. Uh, in Iraq before 2003, that was not an issue because everybody felt that the military was uh, used against them to kill them. Uh, if you were a Sunni, if you were a Kurd, if you were a Shia, uh, or if you were an Arab. Um, when that, the, after 2003, when the uh, army and the other security uh, forces were rebuilt, uh, it opened the question of, okay, who, how, how many from this component of the Iraqi society do you have represented? And to date, that is now working, uh, because every, everybody felt that they are either underrepresented, they do not have uh, enough uh, representation, uh, or they distrusted uh, the others. Uh, they said, well, I cannot trust you. And there is uh, evidence where, uh, the, 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 for example, the, the Islamic State or other Sunni groups had access to databases of the Iraqi army and the police where they identified uh, security personnel uh, on the way going home for leave in civilian uniform, taking them out of a taxi, ID them, and, uh, and, and kill them. So when the structure of state uh, falls apart and you rebuild in mixed societies, uh, that, uh, th that is an issue that we see in Iraq. It will be definitely an issue in Syria. Uh, it is, uh, also an issue in in uh, in Libya, but not for sectarian reason. It's just the legitimacy of representation. Why do you want representation? Is an issue. Uh, is an important question. Uh, it, it it this is where it ties to uh, the larger question. Why do you want that representation? And this is a problem I I see in Iraq is that there is too much focus on the institution of an, or military institutions. And uh, m because this drives from a militaristic and security view uh, to addressing some of the sectarian and governance issues. Uh, this is not a uh, response to any of them, just an addition to the conversation that uh, today, as the, the questions of democracy, equality, and representation uh, becomes, uh, uh, increases, uh, this is, it may, it, if certain things were not a question yesterday, they may be a question today, or they may become a question tomorrow. Uh, so the orienting the, 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 the solutions towards the, the root causes of this, if it's ignorance, uh, pe people thinking actually the, uh, the, the Shia uh, are not non-Muslims, uh, then the solution is not a military solution. If it is actually just denial and treating them uh, not as an equal, then the, the solution becomes something else. Uh, just looking at issues from a per perspective of uh, what the two sides of, uh, think of each other, and increasingly the dealing with the Islamic State uh, and Al-Qaeda for many years, it was militaristic for the most part. Today, the, the leadership in Iraq uh, 
deals with the, the, the grievances of the people from a militaristic uh, um, uh, approach. And that is a problem that I see across the board when it comes to the issue of sectarianism. How do we contain this? How do we, how do we make sure that this country will not have more influence? How do we make sure, and not from the, the, the local uh, challenges that uh, Arif also talked about, how do you make sure that they are all equal before the law? You're, you are protected regardless of uh, who is in the state, who is in the security forces. Obviously, this is not a one-day solution. This is an ideal state that you do not probably reach easily. But unless we build those into the programming that we do on peace building and, uh, and governance, uh, uh, we'll be missing an important point. If I could follow up a little bit, uh, we talked about the attitude of the state. Uh, let's ask about that great institution, the ISI. Uh, do we have evidence that the ISI sees some utility in any of the uh, sectarian groups? Uh, I mean, we all know it has a, a long history of backing uh, militant groups when they thought it thought it was to their interest. Um, I'll, I'll just stop there. Um, I think if you look at, it's hard to find any indication that the ISI or the Pakistani military intelligence establishment finds a strategic utility in, in uh, cooperating or enabling uh, specifically anti-Shia uh, anti actors to, uh, to be active publicly and engage in violence. Um, the ASWJ, the sort of political element of uh, the anti-Shia movement, uh, forms, serves a political utility for a wide variety of political actors inside the country. Uh, the LEJ um, mainly uh, performs two functions. It uh, kills Shias, um, either through targeted killings or mass casualty attacks, uh, and it also partners with Al-Qaeda and the TTP, uh, two leading uh, organizations that are combating the Pakistani state. So uh, there isn't really much overlap in terms of uh, shared interests. Um, you know, there is a, there is, uh, there's been some suggestion that elements of the Pakistani state or the intelligence services have worked with, um, you know, so-called death squad leaders in Balochistan and elsewhere that also, um, ha you know, have dual hats and may also, um, on their own side, engage uh, sectarian actors. Uh, so there might be you know, a degree or two of, separa of separation that, um, uh, that, that separates them um, in terms of this, you know, this murky world that exists in some of these hot spots like Balochistan. But I, I don't see much uh, any anecdotal evidence, or if you look at things from a strategic perspective, anything really tying uh, the Pakistani military with these anti-Shia forces. And you know, if you look at how the Pakistani military kind of approaches uh, the idea of Pakistan, uh, they see themselves as, you know, the guardians of Pakistan's physical and ideological frontiers. And there's this idea of the Nazaria of Pakistan or the ideology of Pakistan. And it's really something that is non-sectarian in terms of uh, the Muslim community itself. And so, um, you know, the founder of Pakistan was also uh, a Shia. And so I think in terms of ideology as well, there's not really anything pulling the organization as a whole uh, into that sort of anti-Shia orbit. Uh, the Zia era was uh, somewhat of an anomaly, I think. Brad Hansen, I'd like to go back to the situation of the Afghan uh, Hazar in Pakistan. There's a significantly uh, large community of them that remains in Quetta. And this year and last year, there have been a number of horrific attacks against them in Quetta. Um, I think Mr. Callan had mentioned that the dynamics are a little different regarding attacks against them, against maybe other Shia in Balochistan. The Taliban. Um, of Afghanistan, of course, our uh, Quetta Shore is famous. It's based in Quetta. I'd be interested in, in your comments on these different dynamics and you know what the motivation and, and uh, uh, who are the perpetrators and why are the Afghan Hazar in Quetta so targeted? Uh, 
Well, I think it's important to uh, first note that uh, the Hazara population inside Quetta and adjacent districts in Balochistan are actually, some are Afghan, some are Pakistani. Uh, in terms of the Pakistani uh, segment of that population, they've existed in the area, they've lived in the area since the late 18, 1890s or so. Uh, so when there was some violence and tensions in Afghanistan, they fled to those areas and have kind of made that home for quite some time. And so, you know, if you look, uh, they uh, joined the British Indian Army. Uh, they were s some of the leading commanders of the Pakistan Army at some point in time. Um, uh, up till the 1970s were from that community. So they were kind of well in integrated into Pakistan. Um, the specific targeting of them, of the Pakistani, uh, of Hazaras inside Pakistan began, uh, there was one incident in 1999 in which an MPA or a ministry of a parliamentary, uh, sorry, a provincial assembly member was targeted um, by you know, anti-Shia militants, by Lashkar Jangbi. That was an anomaly. Um, structural uh, or organized violence against uh, Shias, Hazara Shias, really began uh, in 2003. It continued into 2006, but when members of those, that Lashkar Jangbi cell uh, were arrested, the violence basically fell down to zero. Uh, those uh, three individuals that basically led that cell <laughs> escaped from prison in 2007. Uh, from that period on, violence has resurged. Um, it's because uh, there are militant networks that are they're led by locals, ethnic Baloch, uh, who uh, ha share the ideology of Lashkar Jangvi and SSP, you know, the, the same organization that exists across the country. So there is that ideological element uh, that has become uh, indigenized in Balochistan. Uh, the Hazaras are very easy to target. Um, physically, they, they stand out, they look different. Um, and, you know, there's the, the legacy of the conflict in Afghanistan in which, you know, the Hazaras um, resisted the spread of the Taliban, who are also the Obandis, come from that same sect as uh, these anti-Shia groups. Uh, and that kind of, um, uh, uh, I think, uh, incited some of the, um, the, the violence against them. But also there is an ethnic factor as well. Um, I spoke <coughs> with um, a senior p police official in Quetta, and he had said that, he doesn't get any leads from members of other ethnic groups uh, when Hazara Shias are targeted in, in sectarian violence. Uh, so there's a resentment of the Hazaras uh, because uh, they are, to some extent, upwardly mobile. Uh, they're very united. They take advantage of opportunities, <coughs> whether it's joining the police forces or the military. Um, they, uh, their women um, are active participants in society and um, you know, uh, aren't, um, you know, held back, uh, let's say, in, in a comparative perspective compared to other communities. So there is that ethnic factor as well, but <coughs> ultimately they're being targeted because they're Shia. And the same Lashkar Jangbi group that exists elsewhere in the country uh, has a, a branch inside Balochistan that is composed of locals, but shares this ideology that uh, involves animus towards the Shia, and they're being targeted uh, mainly because of their religious affiliation. Say, but a uh, few observations. I think uh, it is quite central to look at the role of the state uh, in the last 30 years and how it has actually uh, created uh, a whole environment, legal and social institutions, which allow for the kind of hatred that is spewed against the Shias and, and Hazara. And I think that can't be overlooked. I mean, it is fundamental to that. I mean, these, these attitudes do not germinate in a vacuum. And uh, if you look at the 1970s and 80s, particularly the Zia regime and General Zia himself was a Sunni supremacist. Uh, he even tried to impose the, um, uh, laws uh, which the Shias and others uh, sort of protested against, like the imposition of forced imposition of zakat in 1980, and uh, and within a year it had to be taken away. So, uh, and then the revision of curricula and textbooks, the Islamic studies curriculum, which is taught to Pakistani kids for the last three generations, is a Sunni version of Islam. Even Shias have to uh, read that, even Ahmadis have to read that, even other uh, mi mi minority groups have to read that. And I think the third is that the security uh, nexus of these groups cannot be overlooked. I think the question that was raised uh, 
uh, by the gentleman um, in that corner is central to this because, uh, first of all, the evidence that we have is that that when the GHQ was attacked, Malik Ishaq was flown in to negotiate with the terrorists. Uh, secondly, we also see that in Balochistan, the Hazaras are being killed because uh, the uh, Baloch uh, nationalist resistance is being countered by a proxy uh, Islamist version. So there is there is a national security dimension. And sadly, uh, in the Punjab, why this uh, proliferates, why there's impunity, why no civilian or military government can actually crack down on these groups is because they're enmeshed into the whole jihad infrastructure. And so, you know, unless there's a jihad uh, uh, policy revision uh, underway, you cannot really do much with these groups. And the, and the electoral alliances that, that have uh, come, come about in the last few years are actually just a kind of a symptom of the larger malaise, which is that these groups are far more powerful than political candidates. I mean, you know, if you have a five or five to ten thousand uh, people armed militia in a particular constituency, a politician has to be a pragmatist uh, and and make peace with them. Uh, no politician can actually uh, fight them unless the state backs them, and the, and, the, and the state does include the police and the intelligence outfits that operate both at the federal and provincial level. So I just wanted to add this. To okay, I think we'll take that as a moment to close. Uh, if any of you would like to make any final remarks, now would be the time. I just, I mean, a very brief one, sure. just to I applaud you and I support those statements. And just to elaborate a little bit, um, I think it's very interesting that you mentioned how um, the potential of offsetting the Baloch nationalist movement with um, relig mobilizing Baloch along religious lines. And I think that there's a, a broad history for the last three decades of the state having an interest in using religion to undercut ethnic separatism. And you know, I think it's very easy to draw the connection with the loss of East Pakistan, of, you know, Bengali, uh, Bengali ethnic separatism. There are all kinds of potential ethnic separatisms in Pakistan. The unifying factor is a nominal Islamic identity. Some people have taken it upon themselves to promote a particularly militant version of Islamic identity so as to, to undercut. I think in the case of Balochistan, it's a nice example where the nationalist movement is, is, is fairly secular, at times even Marxist. So I think uh, it's worth noting and thinking about that in particular. And I thank you for raising that point. Can I just, uh, just one uh, quick point just to complicate the issue, um, not to push it one one direction, but to, uh, uh, demonstrate that the situation is quite blurry. So without uh, contesting what was said, there are also indications that uh, Lashkar Jangbi or elements within Lashkar Jangbi in Balochistan have linkages to uh, the Balochistan Liberation Army, uh, so an anti-state, ethnic, supposedly secular uh, militant group. Uh, so for example, on at least three occasions in the past two years, when there was a mass casualty attack targeting the Shias, there, those attacks were preceded by smaller attacks by, uh, uh, that were claimed by the BLA or the Baloch Republican Army, the BRA. So when I spoke with this uh, police official in Quetta, he had said that the objective was to, you know, this first small attack pulls the police in one direction and that uh, increases the possibility for, um, you know, the big attack to, to take place because police forces are far more reduced in, in other areas of the city. So, um, you know, that doesn't uh, mean that this is a simple binary, that we either have elements of the state that are connected to these groups and anti-state forces or not. Um, but what it demonstrates is that these groups, uh, like um, uh, Lashkar Jangbi, uh, very much have a, a solid presence in all, these, uh, in all these parts of the country. They're not like, let's say, you know, ethnic Punjabis who are in Fatah. They're not sort of a f a fish and sort of out of their own water. These are ethnic Baloch who are based there. And there are these kind of a, a tactical alliances that uh, occur between networks within one, uh, cells within one network and uh, seemingly, um, you know, uh, conflicting alliances within that same network. Yeah, I think I agree with uh, what has been said, but I would like to also complicate this a little bit further. Uh, when you have um, 
uh, the, the so-called Islamic State carving large territory and uh, doing its own schools and its own education uh, in physical territory that the rest of the world cannot access, uh, where it can, where it creates its space through social media and other alternatives to uh, spread its ideology and it, uh, uh, things of this nature, uh, it complicates the question, uh, the issue further. Uh, and these organizations, the Islamic State and others, uh, they are networks of networks. They have, they connect with each other very fast, and they work and operate at the at the local level, uh, and uh, they they al ally with each other very fast. But the the forces that try to counter um, uh, such ideology and such action is slower in response. And uh, this is an an issue that uh, there are century issues of centuries of of, of myth and misinformation and uh, demonization of the others. Uh, there comes out fatwas and uh, religious leaders from this corner of the world, from that country, but translating those into actually a common effort uh, at, at, uh, for those who, like uh, if Ayatollah uh, al-Sistani and, uh, and the Azhar and the others come in some sort of forum, they may come together, it may be uh, their the representation, but translating that into the ground, into action, this is, this is still very much lacking in every corner of the world that struggles with this issue. Uh, there was a documentary, I think it was by PBS, where they uh, uh, interview uh, ambassador, former Ambassador Ryan Crocker, uh, who served in Afghanistan and Iraq, where he says uh, the Islamic State is Al-Qaeda 6.0. And I tweeted about that. I said, but the world reaction to this and dealing with it is still, at best, 3.0. So w changing education system, yes, this is something, it's a must. Uh, but we also need to s look ahead of the curve and see uh, where this is going with this much technology, with this the transformation of uh, the ISIS, yes, came out of governance failure uh, in Iraq and Syria, uh, but where this is going so that we cannot be th three steps behind the next time. Okay, so I'll have the last word then. Um, I just wanted to say that I agree uh, with Reza. I'm really glad you raised those points. I think they're really important because we have mentioned, um, you know, the role of the political parties in these alliances, and that's my personal research interest. That's what I'm doing in my dissertation as well. But I think it's very important not to remove this from the context of Pakistan, which is that the army and the ISI are very, very important when we talk. When the word jihad comes up, jihadist networks, you can't not talk about the army. I think the role of Malik Ishaq, the example that Reza cited, Newsweek has done a, a wonderful articles on this topic, and it's there's a reason he's not always been in jail. There's a reason he's been coming in and out, and the reason is not the PMLN. They just don't have the power structure existent in Pakistan for this to be the case. And you see in Karachi as well, um, when they were trying to target the MQM, Karachi police officials say that they would go and capture certain individuals, and then they'd be asked by elements of the state to release them again. And you, the same thing with the Punjab police. There's no consistent motivation for the Punjab police to target these elements because of orders that are being given. And I mean, that's not evidence per se, but it's certainly um, a narrative that exists and it's worth uh, keeping in mind. So. Okay, with that, thank you everyone again for joining us today. And uh, again, if you're interested in any of the publications that were mentioned today, there are copies in the back and they're on our website, usip.org. Thanks.